tonight we are going to Mars. Uh, not actually, in fact, but at least virtually. And you're going to meet three scientists from the SETI Institute who are going to talk about their work involved in understanding how we inform the search for life on Mars and uh, develop the technologies, methodologies, and modalities for, for that kind of research and that eventual kind of exploration. I think that even in my lifetime, let me check, uh, it's possible that we will set foot on Mars, that humans will set foot on Mars. I'll probably be too old to do it myself, but we'll certainly watch when it happens. So very, very exciting times uh, ahead. Tonight's talk is called Roving on Mars, Revving Up for Future Exploration of the Red Planet. So we will get right into that. Uh, I did want to mention a couple of other interesting things before we go. And uh, uh, so, you know, welcome to Mars. This photo hasn't been actually taken yet, so if anybody thinks that this came from the Curiosity rover, I do want to advise you that this is not a real photograph, but, but hopefully this is not too, too much further in our future. Um, but where Mars is concerned and the study of astrobiology or the study of life in the universe is concerned, this is one of the key areas of research of the SETI Institute. Uh, so we're more than just an institute looking for signals and signs of technology through radio telescopes and optical instruments, but we also do astrobiology, planetary science, astronomy, and astrophysics, et cetera. And we had a wonderful thing happen this past weekend. Uh, I don't know how many of you out there get the New York Times, Sunday New York Times, quite a number of you. So this is the New York Times magazine. That's not me on the cover. It's a reasonable facsimile. But um, this is the Sunday New York Times. Uh, magazine from this past weekend, and if you had a chance to peruse it, uh, you might have come across this uh, spread in the magazine. This is a story called In Orbit, and this is a story about the head of research uh, at the SETI Institute, what we call the Carl Sagan Center for Research. This is Dr. Natalie Cabral, and uh, Natalie was featured in an article uh, that talks about voyagers and explorers um, in the New York Times, and she's one of four featured stories there. And this is about her work with her NASA Astrobiology Institute team, uh, which is a large team of researchers that do their work in Chile, in the Atacama, and the Altiplano, and the Andes Mountains. And actually, Natalie is here with us tonight, so maybe, Natalie, you could just stand up and take a, a little bow, because we're all so, so proud to have you here. And uh, so this is, um, you know, what it looks like where she does the work. It's uh, kind of an interesting place. That's a Martian, obviously. And, um, uh, but an absolutely stunning, barren, and I I extremely beautiful landscape. And another uh, Mars analog site that, that informs us about uh, developing technologies for life on Mars. So if you get a chance, read the article. It's beautiful, written beautifully written story about uh, Natalie and her work and a profile of uh, an amazing uh, woman scientist like a couple of the other women scientists you're going to meet from the Institute this evening. And uh, there's some wonderful pictures in the uh, article. And we also have um, a story on our website at SETI.org about the article about Natalie's work. And there's an amazing gallery full of photographs. So if you want to see what it's like to work in, in Chile in this kind of research, uh, I invite you to visit the site. Um, actually, there's one of the researchers who will be speaking to you tonight is in this picture. He's part of that team. But again, it's a very otherworldly place. And in many places, as you can see, uh, apparently devoid of life, but not in fact. Uh, last but not least, I want to uh, direct you to our website, um, which again is SETI.org. We have a new program called SETI Stars. So you can become a SETI star. And what we're looking for in SETI Stars, stars are the kinds of people who help the Institute do our work by giving us a small donation every month. Just signing up for that, it's just a, whatever amount you're comfortable with that comes off your credit card. But it really does enable meaningful work, including field research, including our education and outreach programs. So if you'd like to uh, consider becoming one of our stars, take a look at our website. They, right on the home page, you'll see information about that. We're also live streaming tonight uh, here from SRI in Menlo Park. And uh, so we welcome our Facebook audience who will be joining us this evening and uh, as well on the Facebook um, link to this talk, we have an opportunity that lets our viewers, wherever they may be around the world, also support our work by hitting the donate button. So don't hesitate if you're out there in Facebook land to hit that button and, and support the work of the SETI Institute. 
All right, and without further ado, I'd like to turn the podium over to my esteemed colleague who is our senior astronomer and a fellow of the SETI Institute and also happens to be the host of our amazing science radio program called Big Picture Science, and that would be Dr. Seth Shostak, and he will introduce our speakers and tell you a little bit more about tonight. Seth? Mars, also known as the Red Planet, or if neither of those appellations resonates with you, I can give you a few more. al Kahira, Ares in Greek, uh, Baram, Herdesher, Huat Singh, Kase, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing all of these, Lahu, Ma'adim, Marte, Marth, and of course, Barsoom. Now, <laughs> there's some Edgar Rice Burroughs fans in the audience. It's obviously uh, drawn the attention of humans for a long time, mostly because of its red color and also the fact that it moves in a somewhat erratic fashion across the sky. But Mars is everyone's favorite inhabited planet, and it has been from the beginning, right? There are Martians everywhere, books, movies, radio plays. They're, they're just Martians everywhere. There may possibly also be Martians on Mars. Well, you might ask, why is it so interesting, aside from these uh, attributes that I just mentioned? It turns out that after the invention of the telescope, well, not the invention, but the first use of the telescope, looking at the sky as opposed to the neighbors, so that would have been about 1609 when Galileo did that, uh, astronomers eventually realized that Mars was the only planet where they could actually see any details on the surface. They were looking at the surface. When you think about it, Mercury, you can look at Mercury through a small telescope and you see a little dot, right? You don't learn much from that. You can look at Venus, but you're looking at a bunch of clouds, right? Jupiter, Saturn, again, you're looking at the weather, you're not looking at the surface, but with Mars, you are looking at the surface. And it was rather quickly realized, about the time of the US, uh, you know, the uh, War of Independence, actually, in the 1770s, that Mars has a day that's 24 hours, more or less, it's actually more, right? It also has an axial tilt that's 25 degrees, that's very close to the Earth's, 23 and a half degrees, so, you know, Mars has, has uh, seasons. And so, it was little wonder that William Herschel, who is said to be the best astronomer of all time, at least he said that about himself. I think that that's probably true. But he was giving a presentation to the Royal Society in London in 1784, and he said, I quote here, Mars has considerable but moderate atmosphere so that its inhabitants probably enjoy a situation in many respects similar to our own. I think that's interesting, 1784, and he was talking about Martians. Well, of course, the belief in Martians grew, the Giovanni Scaparelli, uh, Percival Lowell, and so forth, the whole Manal, uh, canal controversy at the beginning of the 20th century, a little before. And indeed, when the, the Mars, uh, the Mariner 4 spacecraft, NASA's Mariner 4, made the first sort of up-close photos of Mars, NASA was showing these to the president, and Lyndon Johnson looked at them and said, so where are the canals? which is a tribute to American science education. Okay, <laughs> Mars is still everyone's favorite planet, at least when it comes to looking for life. We send a lot of hardware to Mars, some to land, some to orbit, and those data have positively transformed our impression of this world. Uh, tonight, three of our scientists who study Mars, and by the way, Mars is the single uh, most popular object of study at the SETI Institute. Three of them will tell you a little bit about the mineralogy, the hydrology, the futurology of Mars, and when they are finished with their discussions, uh, there will be some intramural, you know, discussion, and after that you can grill them like a burger. So, uh, let's get right to it. <laughs> Too late for that, but all right, let's get to it. We'll begin with Janice Bishop. Janice is a chemist and a planetary scientist at the SETI Institute. She explores the planet Mars using reflectance spectroscopy. And I know that at least 20% of the audience knows what that is, at, at visible and infrared wavelengths. And she's trying to build a library of the characteristics of rocks so that when we find something similar on Mars, we can look it up in the library. Janice, rock on. So I'm gonna begin telling you a little bit about the, the upcoming missions to Mars and how we're gonna be identifying landing sites. So this, this is the planet, probably a lot of you have heard about Mars. There are poles on the north and the south where there's ice and then the middle region of the planet is covered by dust periodically when there's a dust storm and otherwise it looks like this. There's a difference between the south and the north. 
And you'll see that on some upcoming maps. We've had several landers and, and rovers that have already traveled to Mars. So these at the top have been there already, and these are planned in the near future. For the Mars 2020 mission, this is a NASA mission. There will be one rover, and the scientific commu uh, community meets periodically to pick a landing site. And we whittled it down from many, many to eight, and then to three. And so these are the three that we're going to be deciding on. And ESA also is sending a rover. So I'll be talking about these three potential landing sites that NASA is considering, and then also the two that ESA is considering. Oops. So for the NASA mission, the, the rover is going to be dropped like this by a parachute. And then it will land on the surface. And then the rover is going to drive around to several places, and it's going to collect samples and then bring them back. So not only is this rover exploring and measuring the surface, but it's also going to collect samples for a future mission called Mar Mars Sample Return. So it's important where we pick this spot, because not only is it going to be studied now in the near future, but it could be studied for years to come with the samples that we bring back. So this is a map, and this shows you the planet Mars with the southern area that's a higher elevation, and you see all these crater marks there, and the northern part that's a lower elevation, and it looks smoother. Some people think there might have been an ocean there, or it could be covered with dust. In any case, I've marked the past landing sites on here, and what I just wanted to show you was that we've landed in many places, and the first landers, the Viking 1 and Viking 2, they landed up in this northern smooth part that it, the colors uh, refer to elevation here. So the blue is low and green, yellow sort of mid altitudes and then up here the red and this is the highest altitude. So these low regions are kind of boring, but the engineers at JPL think safe. And so the first rovers were safe and boring and as time's gone on, the engineers have gotten a little bit better. Instead of landing at the size of Menlo Park, now they can land somewhere that's a smaller region. And so as, as we move down the size of the landing site, then we can be more precise about where we're going to park the rover and land safely. So we don't want to land on top of a mountain or inside some giant crater that we can't get out of unless it's one we really want to study. So in any case, the, the next one was Pathfinder. So the Viking was in the 70s, Pathfinder was then in the 90s, and then we had the twin Opportunity and Spirit uh, MER rovers, and then Gale Curiosity is the one you hear most about now. And InSight will be launching soon. InSight is just a lander, though, uh, like Phoenix. So no movement. It's You land, and that's it. That's where you are. So as we're making this decision where we're going to go for the next landing sites, we're usually using the remote sensing data sets, and that's what I do. And so we're looking at surfaces of the planet, and these are some example images where we're looking for mineralogy, and that tells us things like geologic history, water, potentially habitability, so is the planet habitable, and then if maybe there is actually life, hopefully some future rovers will tell us that. But what we see are pictures of the surface, but then we can identify the mineral as well, minerals through fingerprints, and I'll talk a little bit about how we do that, and then we lay that over the topography. And one thing I wanted to show you also is this timeline here. So early in Mars' history, we think the planet had water because there are water features that Ginny's going to tell you about, and also because we have minerals that need water to form. And then over time, a lot of this could be buried beneath the surface, but the planet has been dry for a long, long time. So any of the water activity and a lot of these interesting alteration minerals were formed a long time ago. So how do we find out what minerals are there? We use something called spectroscopy. And in particular, this is reflectance spectroscopy. So in order to do that, we need a source. It can be the sun, or it can be a lamp, anything that shines light on your surface. So then you need a rock or a surface. And then you need a detector. 
So all of us are spectrometers, each of you in this room. We all can see three colors, and our brain processes the information that our detectors are collecting, and everything we see is then combined into various colors. And that's how our brain works in terms of color and spectroscopy. But the instruments like um, CRISM that I work with they use 544 channels, so a little more than the three that we humans have. And so for a, a two-dimensional place along the surface, there are 544 colors deep. And so each, each pixel then, each spot in the image has 544 channels. And then when we're seeing different minerals in a rock scene here, they have different wiggly lines, like the red and the green and the blue. So Memorize these, we'll have a test later. But the, the main point is to, hopefully everybody can agree, unless you're colorblind, that the red and the green and the blue are different. So that we use the different shapes of where these peaks fall to identify different minerals. So this map shows the planet Mars again, and what I wanted to illustrate were these green and blue marks and that they kind of occur all across the planet. So the green are places where we've seen clays, and clays are minerals that need water to form. And the blue are places where we have other hydrated minerals, so not clays, but sulfates or chlorine salts or other things. So it's not just one place somewhere, but it's all over the planet. And so in particular, these places where we see hydrated minerals are usually where we want to send rovers. So Gusev Crater is a place we sent already the MER rover Spirit, and it's one of the candidates. Columbia Hills in the middle of this crater is a candidate, and one of the three that NASA is considering. And the other two sites are clustered together in this Nili Fossa area, and one is called Jezero Crater, and one is called Northeast Sirtis. And they're very close here. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about these three sites. So first, the Gusev Crater, there's the craters here, and it's formed a crater lake, and inside this lake, so there, there are different um, water-related processes that Ginny will probably talk about, but in the middle of this region is the Columbia Hills, and this outcrop here has some interesting carbonate and sulfate and silica minerals, and from the kind of work I do, that's interesting. So it, it doesn't have the clays that we see in most of the ancient rocks, so it's a little bit different, but it sees uh, we, we've seen carbonates, sulfates, and silica. So that's, uh, that means that there's been alteration and there's been water. And so in terms of chemistry on the planet and perhaps life, that's an interesting place to go. And this is a view from the, the PanCam imager from uh, the previous rover. And there are these arrows pointing out bright outcrops. And then this is an example of one of these where Steve Ruff and colleagues have, have looked at these in detail and then looked at some of the sites that Natalie's interested in Chile, and the silica deposits here look very similar to so, some of the ones in Chile. So looking at the camera scale from the top of the rover to the microscopic imager scale as well. So one advantage to this site is that we've been there before, so we know a little bit about it already. And some people think that's exciting, so, and others prefer other sites that have a lot more clays on the surface. So like voting for politicians, uh, voting for landing sites gets very political, and everybody has their favorite, and they're out nearly to kill to get their favorite spot. So <laughs> our meetings get very interesting. So this is the next site I was going to talk about, Jezero Crater. And this, again, is probably was a lake. Uh, it was a, an impact crater that filled up with water, and then we, we see minerals that formed here. There's some delta deposits, and there's carbonates that formed sort of up in this region, and carbonates down below. There are ancient rocks here. The Nowakian is sort of the, time, the name for the old rocks on Mars. Nowakian is the oldest time period, and then Hesperian. So these old, ancient Nowakian rocks contain a lot of clays and some carbonates. And then there, uh, there are also some, some sulfates in this area, too. One, one issue with this site is that 
a lot of the sediments have sort of mobilized, and so it has interesting mineralogy here, and a lot of people really like this site because it looks sort of like a lake, but because of the, the sediments are mobile, then the rocks and the minerals probably aren't where they initially were, where they formed. So if you're looking at the minerals to tell you about the geologic history of that particular rock you see and how that one right there formed, then this site can't tell you that. So there are pluses and minuses for every site. And nearby, so this is Jezero Crater up here nearby, this is called Northeast Sirtis, and it's named after the Sirtis volcano, which is out over here. So this site is flatter and flat and safe, but it has interesting mineralogy, and it has some cap rocks and the volcanic lavas. It has the Sirtis Major. So we have basement rocks, we have sulfates, we have carbonates, and a lot of clays. So this site perhaps has more mineralogy than the others that's tied to the surface rocks and to the history. And again, this is a zoomed up re region where you can see that the lips is up here, so it would be outside the landing lips, but usually the rovers last a little bit longer than we hope, and they drive around their lips, and then they take off for further distances. So then we can see a change from sulfates to phyllosilicates, which would mean a change in pH. And these are those wiggly lines I talked to you about before, and this is how we identify the mineralogy that we see in these images. So switching now to um, what ESA is looking at for its rover, it's called ExoMars. There is one site called Oxyoplanum here, and another site called Marth Vallis here. And I didn't mention the, the landing ellipse was about 10 kilometers for the NASA mission, but it's about 120 for the European mission. And that means big ellipse, safe, somewhat boring spot. So you can't go to a small place that's maybe more dangerous. It has to be a, a wider ellipse. So these two places. And I also wanted to mention this one called Marth Vallis. The valleys on Mars are named after words that mean Mars in other languages. So uh, as Seth was rattling these off, I was like, oh yeah, that valley's over here, that valley's over here. So uh, I, it's interesting why they have such weird names sometimes for valleys, but um, they're what Mars means in those different languages. So let's take a quick look then at Oxyoplanum. We, we use the omega and chrism spectrometers and map this region from Marth Vallis down to Oxyoplanum. And so where you see blue and red on this map, that means that we've found hydrated minerals, clays and other hydrated minerals, and that means alteration and chemistry and water and perhaps life. So those are the interesting sites. These are two potential landing sites drawn here, and this is an image showing the layered rocks that contain the iron magnesium clays and a little bit of variation in the types of clays and then another, um, the cap rock at the top. And this is inside a wall of an impact crater. So switching then to Marth Vallis, this site then, there's a big impact crater here and there's a channel and the, the smoothest place they could find to land is down here. NASA's considered landing sites in this region or in this region that are smaller and have more clays, they still have clays here. And so if you look at this image, the bright spots here are the clays. And these are two potential landing ellipses. And up here is a more zoomed in region that's showing the clays and the cap rock and a channel. So looking at the Marth Vallis region, similar to Northeast Sirtis, it has Noachian trains with clays and carbonates, and it also has exposures of sulfates interbedded with some of the clays. And so this, these are what the rocks look like in this region from orbit. And this is something a, a graduate student I'm working with made recently. So if this is that channel, let me go back. So if you're standing in this channel and looking south, this is what you'll see. This is that channel. So you're standing in the channel and looking up at the wall. So you can see these layers of the, the clays and also the red spots here are sulfates in there. So one advantage to this site is that you have the clays and the sulfates kind of interbedded. And this finally then is another image from orbit where we see lighter terrains that are the, the clays and sulfates. 
and I've marked different kinds of sulfates here, jarosite in green and alunite in, in white, and over here different kinds of clays, so aluminum clays in yellow and iron clays in red. And these, these are what the spectra look like, these wiggly lines that we use to identify the minerals. And then when we're looking at the images, we color code them in three colors. That's sort of what we're restricted to. So we pick a different set of three, depending on what project we're working on, and um, that's how we can better visualize these. So I wanted to end with this map again. This shows clay detections across the planet. And in black are the landing sites we've been to, and in white are the five that we're thinking of. So, well, InSight will be uh, la uh, launching a lander next month, or about early May, I think. May and then Gusev, we went to before, but it's, it's up for, for potentially going again. And then the two, Jezero and Northeast Sirtis, are in here, in the Nili Fossi area, Marth Vallis, and then Oxia Planum. So those are the landing sites you're going to hear more about coming up. Very good. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ginny Gulick, and Ginny is a senior research scientist at the SETI Institute. She examines erosional features on Mars, looking for telltale signs of running water, not necessarily today's running water. Uh, and uh, she looks at high resolution imaging photography of the team that's done from orbit, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Uh, Ginny's just about set up here. Okay, well, thank you. I'm happy to be here. I'm going to just uh, briefly discuss the water landscapes, um, waterform landscapes of the of the different uh, landing sites that have been proposed. So I'll be going very, very quickly. And uh, thanks to Janice for for covering some of this. But one thing, if you look at the uh, the uh, global map of Mars, you'll see that all the current um, the proposed landing sites are along this dichotomy boundary. And this is not a coincidence, because this is a very exciting area, especially if we're looking for signs of life or looking for ancient uh, rocks um, that were um, eroded by water. These, these are excellent areas to look. Uh, these are the ExoMars, the European um, landing sites, and of course, these are the Mars 2020 that I'll get into talking to them but all very briefly. Okay, so before I do, I just wanted to give you a really, really quick summary of the water history of Mars in about uh, <laughs> two minutes or less. Um, but one thing I wanted to draw your attention to is this center map here. These little red marks and stuff, these are the, the locations, the distributions of the, all the valleys and channels on Mars. And if you can see, they kind of follow this dichotomy boundary like I, I showed you here. Um, and Again, like as Janice mentioned, this is a high region. It's about one or two kilometers or even, or even much higher than the uh, lowlands, which are much um, younger. And when the water flowed on the surface, it eventually did flow into this northern area, possibly and probably forming an ocean perhaps many times in its history. Um, okay, so the other thing I wanted to point out is that these are the landing sites here. As you can see that they're... Uh, formed mostly in the Nawaki into early Hesperian, and that's right when the valley networks are forming and the beginning of the, the outflow channels, and I'll get to that right now. Uh, but this period between three and a half and four billion years uh, ago did have lots of water because the atmospheric pressure is thought to have been higher than it is uh, currently. Okay, this is just an example of what are called the valley networks on Mars. This is Warrego Vallis, and this is in the heavily cratered uh, uplands, in the ancient uplands of Mars. This is most, mostly used as the um, type example for uh, water flowing on the surface of Mars over long periods of time, say at least 100,000 years, if not tens of millions of years. And just to, just to let you in on a little secret, I think, don't think this is rainfall. I think it might have been snow melt. Because if you look along, this is formed along a plateau. And if you look along that plateau for 1,000 kilometers in either direction, you don't really see a valley network along that plateau. So anyhow, um, this is also some, uh, uh, this is called Nergal Valleys. These are some of the large valley systems that are also forming during this time. 
And then this is just an example of the outflow channels. These channels form fairly quickly over periods of days to weeks to, to years, and they form mostly by they're thought to form mostly by catastrophic release of groundwater onto the surface of Mars, carving um, these channels in the surface of Mars. So the water was bank full here to the top of these channels, whereas this, these are longer persistent flows, and they took a long period of time, like I said, to, uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of years to tens of millions of years or longer. And they were periodically active, probably over a billion years or so. Okay, just starting with the first uh, landing site, this is Marth Vallis again. Janice showed you a picture similar to this. But I also wanted to point out that, again, along this dichotomy boundary, the other uh, East, uh, ExoMars landing site is very close by. And then here is uh, Eris Vallis, which is where Pathfinder was and Viking Lander 1 was further out. So it's in the Chrissy Basin area where most of the outflow channels on Mars are thought to have formed and the floodwaters uh, pooled in this area and might have formed the um, ancient ocean. Okay, this is what the landing ellipse looks like. This is a uh, part of Marth Vallis, as Janice showed. But here are the little channels that have been mapped it within the valley system. So probably this valley system may not have been um, full to the full full to the uh, valley uh, on either side. It might have just been formed most of the time by these little drainages. Um, also, Marth Vallis contains these uh, fractures, and uh, they're filled with um, different minerals that we think are formed by hydrothermal mineral deposits. And what happens in that is that um, uh, water from below the surface is brought to the surface and fills these fractures uh, with minerals. And as that water cools, the minerals in the fractures uh, precipitate. Okay, um, these are other, uh, another image I wanted to point out that Marth has a lot of layering. Janice also pointed that out too. And this is just to show you that the, um, that Marth Vallis is quite a long uh, valley system and it probably formed over a, a very long period of time and it probably was active periodically. So this extends for hundreds of kilometers into the ancient terrains. And uh, as water flowed in this area, it, it spilled into the northern plains. Uh, let's see. And this is just a timeline showing you this, the periods of, of uh, erosion and activity in Marth Vallis, and that more recently, really nothing's been happening. So most of the activity took place early on. OK, just some more. Uh, uh, diagrams of Marth Vallis. This is what's called a stratigraphic column. This is just showing the uh, layered units that we see in Marth Vallis, and the, the ones on the bottom are the oldest. And the rover is supposed to be able to sample all these different stratigraphic layers. On the right is uh, just a uh, a notional traverse of the rovers and to show of, of a rover traverse to show where they might sample some of these units. Uh, the next ExoMars candidate landing site is uh, Oxia Planum. Again, uh, it is formed in the northern lowlands uh, along the uh, dichotomy boundary, and it is formed down a uh, slope of a uh, ancient valley network called Kogun Vallis. And this again has spread and uh, uh, extends for several hundred kilometers into the ancient islands. And as it does so, if we think about how these formed over um, tens of uh, millions of years periodically, it's bringing uh, sediment uh, from the highlands down and depositing it into uh, these delta regions or other landforms. So it's providing a record for uh, the ancient uh, highlands that we really can't sample right yet. So this is a uh, image that shows the, uh, the elevation data. But this here, this little finger uh, type uh, landform is thought to be a delta. Uh, so the, the material from this uh, Kogun Vallis, the sediment was deposited in a a body of water at some point. And we know that this is fine gray material. This is a, a picture of uh, what's called a Themis nighttime uh, uh, infrared image. And in these type of images, 
dark um, areas are fine grained because they don't hold the heat um, very long during the night, and the, the brighter areas are rocky. So you can see that this, um, this little fingertip landform, or the delta as we think it is, is formed of fine grained sediments. So these are just little cartoons of a, a scenario of how we think that land formed, uh, formed and the delta formed, and one is uh, during the early Hesperian, which is the middle, early part of the middle part of Mars's geologic history. Uh, the Kogun Vallis was active and a deposited sediment in a body of water. And um, then there is uh, also uh, more um, fluvial development. Some of this uh, water dried up, and so then the delta became eroded by uh, other uh, river valleys um, and drainages uh, eroding back into this finer grain deposit. And then during the later part of Mars, history became covered by a, a, a fine grain deposit. It might be basaltic sands. And then more closer to the day that this material is being eroded. And so then again, we see the delta deposits. OK, this is. Um, Sirtis, uh, Northeast Sirtis area. This area is typified by um, mesa capped uh, or mesas with a, a nice um, stratigraphy with, that are uh, capped by resistant material. And again, this area has uh, some uh, drainages from the uh, uh, ancient highlands like the other uh, landing sites. And again, this is just a cartoon showing the different types of layers that, we're, that we see in this type of a, a, a mesa, a flat top mesa. But here, uh, someone has um, mapped the drainages. As you can see, there are some discontinuous drainages that go into this low area, uh, which probably was a pond, which probably was a lake, and then it overtopped this area and then flowed into the northern plains later. So this is just a longitudinal profile, so taking from the, the source region down to the sink. And so you can see right here, this area here, which is this, uh, did form some kind of a, a, a basin, and it may have provided uh, a sedimentary sink where you would have finer grain materials uh, collecting and potentially any kind of uh, organics that were available from the ancient highlands could have deposited in here. Okay, this is just a kind of summary of the history of uh, Sirtis Major. I won't go into that. Um, oh, this is, this is, it's kind of, I have to say this is one of my favorite, if not my favorite uh, uh, landing site. Uh, primarily because it's just beautiful. It has a beautiful delta deposit. You can clearly see the landforms, and there's different types of, uh, of deposits that we can actually go to and sample. And again, this is, this is the Jezero Crater uh, Delta, and there are, um, which is formed in Jezero Crater, and there are also um, drainages, channels, valleys that have uh, drained into this area. It's quite extensive uh, drainage basin area, and here's the landing site right here, and uh, Jezero Craters right here. And at one point again, this overtopped and the water drained into the northern plains. So these are just some more cartoons of what it might look like. There is this mafic uh, cap unit, and this is that uh, uh, Jezero Crater area. Um, again, this is just like a geologic map of the um, drainage basin area or watershed. But you can see there's a whole variety of different types of uh, units, sedimentary units. Um, and this last one is just the uh, uh, Jezero um, Delta. And this is, again, a notional uh, traverse of a, of a rover. It starts here. This is the ellipse and how it would sample the different types of, of units within the uh, crater. So fairly easy driving. It's only you know several kilometers apart, so it's possible. And lastly, the Columbia Hills, Janice already showed this uh, image, so I'm not going to uh, focus on that too much. This is another one just to show you, just to trace the, uh, the Mahadim Vallis that, again, 
uh, formed hundreds of kilometers into the ancient uh, highlands, uh, and at one time or several times during Mars's history, water flowed in this area. Again, uh, Gusev um, has a delta like Jezero uh, Crater, but the landing site's further down, so we probably wouldn't be able to visit it, but it's kind of like thought of the original delta on Mars that people have studied. Again, Janice showed this. It's just a uh, nice perspective view of the Columbia Hills region. And lastly, I just want to show another uh, nice view of uh, the um, Columbia Hills. And, you know, why are we going to um, Gusev and Columbia Hills again? Well, one important reason is because we've done a lot of studies and we, we realize that these are areas where there were hydrothermal spring deposits. And we know from terrestrial analogs such as um, the El Tadio region that uh, uh, Natalie and others have been studying, Pablo, and, and that um, it's very similar to what we see in the Columbia Hills. And the El Tadio region has uh, biosignatures. It has uh, blue-green algae. These are uh, calithrix uh, uh, I don't know what you call them, rods or whatever, these brown areas. And, you know, it, we know where to look in, in Columbia and uh, in the Columbia Hills, and we just need to go to those areas to see if we're finding any signs for past life. So I think that's it. Yes. Thank you. Our third speaker, our final speaker, is Pablo Sabron, a research scientist at the SETI Institute, has a strong interest in robotic space exploration and comparative analog science where you, you know, find Mars on Earth, uh, such as uh, the article about Natalie Cabral was talking about. We have another scientist who does that up in the Canadian Arctic where you find a place that's sort of like Mars. I noticed, Pablo, that uh, you're not worried about the robots taking over your job. You're, they're going to work for you. That's Pablo the Sabron. That's the hope. <laughs> hey, thanks, Ginny and Janice and all the teams that you're working with. Uh, because it's because of them and thanks to them that we're able to build rovers, build technology to land on Mars, and actually look for things that are interesting for, for the science community. So uh, while we wait for the landing sites to be finalized and decided and the science tell us, hey, this is where you're going, uh, we've already been working on the rovers for about 10 years. So it takes a month of work that is almost incredible. The teams that go into building these uh, machines are unbelievable as well. And at the end, the ultimate goal is to uh, uh, understand Mars better. And one of the angles, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, okay. Oh. So one of the angles that we're looking at uh, very, very uh, intensively now, and as Bill is uh, saying earlier, and that Natalie has been doing uh, for many years, is we're looking for life. We're ready now, we have built technology that is small enough, and is rugged enough, and is powerful enough to be able to be sent to Mars and look for life over there. Not only that, but we and the next generation of rovers, and you'll see some pictures of them, will be able to cache and get some samples ready for eventual sample return. So someday some rover will go there, get them, and take them back to us in our labs. So uh, then again, it's all thanks to all the work that has been done to map the planet globally that we're actually able to build technology that fits the needs of the science community as we're, uh, as we're seeing uh, with the work today. So uh, uh, this is a lot of stuff here, but uh, basically uh, it fills in what uh, Ginny and Janice were, uh, were talking about before, is that uh, we send a number of uh, rovers and landers already that have taught us everything we know about Mars, basically. And every time we send a new mission, we learn an amazing new amount of things. And, and everything, because of technological constraints, uh, everything started at the beginning with follow the water. So water is something that we think is unique to life. So if we're going to find life, life needs water to, to thrive, right? So, uh, so we're looking for water as a way for us to kind of si signal the way or where are we going towards looking for life. But as we're progressing in technological developments and learning about Mars, we're working towards understanding not just water, but also what other things make life possible. Uh, you need nutrients, you need energy, you need habitable environments. That's how we call it. Habitability is the part of space sciences that deals with finding places where life may have developed in the past or may have uh, or may develop in the future or may exist today. So uh, taking it a step further is uh, looking for the actual science of life. So now with Curiosity, the last rover, the rover that is working on Mars as we speak, 
probably Robin as of now. Uh, this Robert has taught us that there is places where life may be happy. It has not found life. It will not find life because it's not ready for that. But it has is telling us every single day that there is places where life may be happy. There's places that are good enough for life to survive. So the next wave of rovers and, and potential human explorers are going actually to be looking for that life. Uh, and part of the work that we do at the Seri Institute is to uh, define what we have to look for. Uh, now we know, again, we know that there is water, there was water on Mars, there is water in the minerals, but there was water, oceans of water, rivers of water, lakes perhaps. Uh, we know that there are places where there are enough conditions, chemistry, energy for life to survive. And now we're trying to, uh, to determine what we have to look for. Okay? Uh, so that's part of the look for signs of life uh, 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 end goal. And obviously, you're hearing a lot in the news now about SpaceX and NASA and the journey to Mars, trying to send humans to Mars. It will happen. I don't know if Bill will be with us or not when that happens. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, hopefully he will. I'm sure he will. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, no, it's, hap it's, it's happening faster than we think. And, and it's just a matter of, you know, as humans, we're explorers. We like to be out there. So it's, it's going to happen uh, uh, for sure. So uh, just hold on a little bit. But before that, uh, we have to keep working with robots. Uh, robots are cheaper, right? And you can break them and you can crush them and that's okay, you know? Some people cry, but you know, no big drama. <laughs> but uh, but uh, while we get ready for sending humans to Mars, uh, there is, in 2020, it's a super important year. And as you see, there's three rover missions that are gonna be launched. And uh, it's three different agencies, actually four different agencies. Uh, obviously, there is the NASA uh, Mars 2020 rover. Uh, uh, there is the European Space Agency in, in uh, collaboration with Roscosmos, that's the Russian Space Agency. Those are the ones who are going to send the, the, the ExoMars rover. And then there's the Chinese uh, Space Administration, which uh, only recently announced that uh, they also want to play the game and send their own rover to Mars. So, uh, so uh, again, as I was saying earlier, uh, now we're ready to look for signs of life. Uh, we know pretty much what those are, as much as technology is concerned. So when we're building the instruments and the tools to look for specific uh, signs of life. And we're, uh, of course, preparing for, for missions to Mars. So specifically, the NASA mission uh, is carrying a, a machine that is going to be able to suck CO2 from the atmosphere and break it down and produce oxygen. They're just trying to demonstrate technology to produce oxygen for future astronauts when we go there. So um, uh, uh, Going straight into the missions, a uh, lot of text here, but never mind. Uh, the NASA Mars mission, uh, again, is, these are complicated missions, a lot of teams, a lot of work, and they usually go into different phases. And we're, this year, we're, we're, we're delivering all the instruments to NASA, and NASA will take a year, year and a half to put them together into the spacecraft, clean everything, make sure everything's ready. It will be launched uh, sometime in uh, the summer of 2020, if everything goes well. It will cruise, uh, travel for about six months and eventually we'll be landing on Mars uh, in the spring of 2021, okay? Uh, and then we'll have a one-year uh, one uh, Earth time mission on Mars, that's two years on Mars, one year on Earth, to do the science that we want to do. Hopefully it will last longer, but uh, the nominal mission is gonna be one year. Uh, so uh, the things that we're gonna be doing is uh, obviously roving, that's why we have a rover, so we wanna be mobile, we wanna look for different places, just in case we don't land on the sweet spot, so we need to have some mobility. We have a very powerful arm that is going to be able to look very closely into, uh, into the samples, not just for minerals and chemistry, but also for the science of life that I was talking about earlier. And uh, lastly, there is uh, the helicopter that is going to, it's very likely that it's going to be flying on Mars. And this is the first time that we fly something on another planet, which is very exciting. And the helicopter is uh, hopefully going to be able to, to, to go far enough to take pictures and get data that it will be able to inform the rover on what is safe to drive and what is not safe to drive. So uh, in a sense, it's, uh, it's a way to increase the capability of the rover. Uh, if you think about the, the rovers on Mars, their maximum speed is usually, it takes usually about two hours to drive 500 feet, right? That's, that's the max speed, okay? So it's pretty slow. This drone can do that in about one minute, okay? So, uh, so you can actually accelerate your data taking uh, by flying as opposed to rover. Obviously, flying on Mars has problems, low density, so you need to have super big uh, blades. 
you have to rotate faster, so the energy thing is a concern. But this is going to be the first techni technical uh, demonstration of uh, flying on other planets, which is pretty impressive. Uh, so um, uh, some of the instruments that the, that the rover has are pictured here. And I'm going to be focusing on two of the instruments that, uh, that we have here. Not only because I'm part of both instruments and I'm working with the teams, but also because they, those instruments uh, target the astrobiology aspect of the search for life on Mars. So it's very close to what we do at SETI. And, uh, and I'm going to be spending a bit more time on, on that. But uh, besides these instruments, we have uh, a MET station, a radar to look down, and a lot of cameras to take pictures, but also to take uh, data that is telling the rover what is safe to go and what is not too safe to go. Um, so uh, one of them is called Sherlock. Uh, and this instrument is, uh, is using a small laser to shine light on the rocks. And this laser interacts with the rocks and it reflects back some of the light of the laser. And this light, when it reflects back, it tells us what the rock is made of. And specifically, we've, we've fine-tuned the laser frequency, the color of the laser, to the UV region. So it's something that we cannot see. It's in the UV, it's something like 255 nanometers. So we cannot see it, but, uh, but it's very powerful to excite fluorescence on the rocks. So when you shine UV, and you probably have seen it in some museums, you shine UV on some of the of rocks, and you turn it off, these things glow yellow, green, blue, purple. So this is the same phenomena, only that we're analyzing that light to be able to constrain the composition of the rocks. So things that we've done in the field so far, and I'm sorry for the bad quality uh, of the picture, uh, but we're, uh, we're testing this system that is almost uh, ready right now. This is like a few years back, but uh, this is the first demonstration of putting this kind of system into a rover, of a, uh, in the arm of a rover, and being able to look close down into the, into the rocks. And the things that we did in that simulation is preparing for the real mission. So when a science team is working on the Earth, on the mission control, usually at the APL in Pasadena, uh, and the rover is working half a billion miles away on Mars, the first thing that the rover sends back to the, to the mission control is, the, is the, this picture. It's a black and white picture. Resolution is also uh, it's way less than your cell phone picture can take today. Uh, but even with that, with that amount of data, the scientists can actually tell what places are interesting to go to. So they select some targets, they tell the engineers to tell the rover to go there and do specific analysis, which is kind of what I try to mark on red on the, on the slide. So these red dots, points there, those are the commands that the science team sends the rover so that the rover can do, the, in this case, the Raman or the laser measurements uh, that we want to do uh, for this. And these are some of the results that we get. And you know, don't mind much about what the peaks mean, but, uh, but uh, as, as, uh, as, in sync, as in the case of Janis uh, pictures earlier, uh, what you see here is some plots, and you see some peaks. So the peaks tells you what the rock is made of. So if you look in the horizontal axis, the, the number below, uh, that tells you what the, what the rock is made of. And how tall the peak is, how intense the peak is, tells you how much of this mineral is there. So when you see peaks from different things, you can actually make ratios and you can tell the abundance of all those things relative to the other. So uh, I'd like to, to point the plot number five that you see there. And you see this blue noisy kind of line, but you see two big peaks and then you see the two other small peaks where I have arrows saying B, or beta carotene should be. And so this is a picture that shows two things. One is that uh, this rock is made of olivine, so that's an a volcanic rock, something that we see on Mars everywhere, but also that uh, there is a carotene molecule. Carotene is, is so to speak, is the sunblock of life. The microbes, bacteria, they use beta-carotene as a pigment to protect them from the UV radiation. UV is bad for us, burns your skin, is bad for any life, it breaks down the molecules of organic complex uh, systems. So, so by using carotene, we're actually looking for life. It's one of these signs of life that I was talking about earlier. We're looking for pigments like this that are trapped within the rock. So in this instrument, this instrument, one of the highlights of, the, of it is that in the real time, this takes like two seconds to get this data, you can see rock and you can also see some of the signs of life that we're looking for just with this compact system that can go in an arm. Okay, so one, one good capability for the, for the NASA mission. Uh, this I even like better, because with this instrument you can do the same thing, uh, but at a distance. So you have a telescope in a mast, and you can shoot that laser up to 10 meters away. So from here to the wall, 
I could be doing this analysis. So again, you don't even have to drive, which again, drive takes time, it's dangerous, you can break the rover, uh, so on, so on. But now with this capability, we can actually interrogate the sample just at the distance. So we can just shoot this laser uh, from far away. So uh, this is a simulation of the system. So we have this telescope on the, on the top right uh, with the person there for scale. This is probably like 12, 15 meters away from the telescope to the, to the scientists. And what you see in the middle of the screen here, this green spot, uh, we're trying to aim at this algae formation that is uh, trapped in the ice. This is a glacier, uh, and we're looking for algae there and trying to see what the, what the spectra look like. So we're shooting the green light on the red sample, and that's what you see on the right side. And you see this monster kind of potato shape uh, uh, peak there, and that's actually very indicative of the fluorescence that this organic sample, algae in this case, is giving us as a sample return, as a, as a signal return from the sample. Um, for us. So we've tested this in the Arctic deserts up to 200 meters even, and it works well. So we're hoping that on Mars can actually do, uh, do good things. So uh, moving on to the European uh, mission. So the ExoMars mission is composed of two main uh, uh, components. One is the Orbiter, which was launched in 2016, and it's been taking pictures already of Mars, and it's, uh, it's been uh, getting data from the atmosphere, and it's helping us to select the, the landing site. And then the rover, which will be sent in 2020. So uh, this rover, the big innovation here is that for the first time, we're going to be able to drill deep on Mars. Deep as in two meters, six feet. So uh, if, I don't know if you, how many of you have drilled a hole in the wall or, or on the floor. It, it's more difficult than it seems. Okay? So, so when you're drilling, you're always taking care of the angle, the feedback, feedback from, the, from the drill, rotation, dust, a lot of parameters that in this case on Mars, we have to teach the rover to do it by itself. We have to teach the machine how to drill safely. And the reason why we haven't done it before is because it's really, really difficult. But now the Europeans think, I guess we think, that we can do it uh, not only shallow, but we can do, go to down to two meters. And two meters is important because that's what we think is the threshold for uh, life survival on Mars. Uh, Mars surface is very harsh, very cold, uh, very oxidizing. So anything that is there is just going to react quickly with, with the CO2 on the atmosphere and it's going to break down. And lastly, the UV radiation is lethal. Like anything exposed there within minutes will probably break down into carbon and you don't even know that there was life there. So, but we think that the, the earth, the soil, is going to be able to, to shield life at about half a meter to two meters. So two meters seems to be a safe number to drill down and get fresh sample that could contain life uh, on Mars. So, uh, so besides the drill, there is a few other instruments that are there and the way it works is that the drill is going to get a core at about half an inch thick core two meters, hopefully, and it's going to digest, it's going to ingest, it's going to ingest that, that core into the, into the rover, it's going to crush it, it's going to make powder, and it's going to distribute that powder to different instruments. And, and again, one of them is a Raman instrument as well, similar to the ones that, that you saw earlier there. So uh, what we've done already is to, to build a prototype of the, this crushing system, and the crushing system, again, powders the sample and fills in little cups, little buckets, and it will rotate that among the instruments. So when, the, when this bucket arrives to our instrument, bottom left picture here, uh, we're able to shoot the laser from above and get spectra like what you see there before. So, and again, this is the same kind of data, the Raman data, that tells you the elements that you have on the horizontal, horizontal uh, elements, the, I guess the molecules that you have, the minerals you have in the horizontal axis, and how much of them do you have there. And here you see a diversity of, uh, of things, and this is actually uh, soils that we, that we collected, uh, or our colleagues collected, I guess, uh, in the Aracama, very near, or actually in the same spots where Natalie and, and her team were, uh, were working on uh, uh, these years. And, uh, and we have diversity of uh, carbonates, clays, sulfates, the things that you've heard about before today, but also we're seeing a certain rest of, uh, of carbon. And remember that I told you, like, when you expose organic matter to the harsh conditions of Mars, or the Aracama, which is the closest thing to Mars that we have here, uh, life just decomposes and just breaks down. So we think we're seeing the, this residual carbon bands is the burnt signs of life uh, on the Aracama. So we're working on ways to maximize this signal and see if this is something that we can use as a library to compare to Mars data in the future. And finally, the Chinese mission, uh, and that's all we know. So a couple of, you know, <laughs> uh, so, uh, so th they really are not very communicative. Uh, but they're slowly unveiling their plans, and, and it's a very ambitious mission. They're going to send an orbiter, a lander, 
and a rover, three in one. It's something that is seldom done because it requires a very powerful rocket to launch. You're risking a lot of money and resources, and uh, but the payoff is crazy. It's, it's amazing if you can pull it off. So uh, we're hoping, and they're already asking for help. Uh, you know, in their ways. You know, like uh, hey, you know, we have this. Would you mind working with us? And but but bottom line is they're gonna have. Uh, 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 med station and they're looking for this mission is not looking for life but it's looking for general geochemistry mineralogy they're starting their Mars program so it's still early for them but they have this in the bottom right picture of the rover you see this red laser so they're gonna have a remote laser uh, as well similar to the ones we have on on the Mars uh, on the NASA Mars 2020 mission only that it's not gonna be able to look for life but only for elements so you'll be able to tell us if there's calcium magnesium potassium hydrogen oxygen but not, uh, not water uh, or, or any other organic things. But uh, it's still going to be super helpful. And we're all thrilled that, uh, that there is three different agencies that are actually pushing for 2020 rovers. I think it's good for everybody. Um, and just the last slide is that uh, just to reinforce that uh, you know, it doesn't matter how good we can build the rover, how good we can build the instruments, how amazing we can actually analyze things on Mars. The only way to eventually, uh, probably, likely, uh, assess whether there was life on Mars is going to be by bringing a sample back. And there is, it's a very simple uh, uh, reasoning. It's when you send things to Mars, you're compromising uh, the sensitivity and the performance of the instrument. Because you have to make it super small, because every pound costs a lot of money. You have to make it super small, because, again, you have reduced volume. It has to withstand crazy, crazy, uh, swing temperatures between day and night, radiation, vibrations during launch, and things like that. So you're really making sure that you're sending something that is going to work, uh, but by that, you're compromising the, the things you can do with it. So at the very end, what we're hoping is that these three missions are going to be able to, to collect the best samples for eventually us to go back there or somebody else go there with another rover and take them back to Earth and analyze them in the lab. And I'll, I'll leave it here. Um, Okay, I'd like uh, Pablon and Janice and Ginny to come up here, and we're going to have a little bit of interactivity, and you're going to get your chance to, uh, to ask questions. I'm going to start with you. I kind of wonder, Pablon, one thing you didn't mention in terms of finding life on Mars is rather than bringing it back, why don't we send some of these people here who are willing to go on a one-way ticket? And if any of them are trained in biology or geology or something, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Not yet, not yet, almost. I mean, you can come to the microphone if you want. You just can't make any noise when you get there. <laughs> I, okay, I, I'm going to ask these guys it, it, just, just two, or two questions, maybe no more than that, because I, I want you to get the chance to, 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 to grill them. Um, where did the water go? You know, why did it go away? I mean. Uh, you've, you've said four billion years ago, four and a half billion years ago, if you went to Mars, you would have, you know, boating opportunities. Um, some of it escaped into the atmosphere, and I think a lot of it is in the subsurface again, and maybe in the northern lowlands region. Uh, some of it's in the polar caps, um, and some of it's just distributed throughout the highlands in uh, aquifers, frozen aquifers. Uh, there was a recent discovery in, uh, on my team, uh, high-rise team, where they uh, found some uh, mid-latitude ice deposits, almost pure ice, uh, throughout the mid-latitude. So frozen water is in the mid-latitudes, not far below the surface. So it's still there? Yep, still there. Why, why did it you know, stop flowing as a liquid on the surface? Was it that Mars lost its atmosphere? Uh, that could be part of it. Uh, I think it just got cold. Got cold. And um, yeah, and it lost its atmosphere, so um, <coughs> liquid water wasn't stable. Janice, did you want to weigh in on any of this? Yeah, part of, I think mine's on. <coughs> that part of it is due to the, the lack of the atmosphere. So in addition to what Ginny was saying, that we don't know what the original atmosphere was. Presumably, it had a thicker atmosphere. Right now, it's about a thousandth <coughs> of what we have. So. There's, it's mostly CO2, but whatever's there is very, very thin. So the, if liquid water were there, it would disorb. It would 
warmer gas. So it's kind of like the Antarctic Dry Valley. So that's why a lot of researchers go to Antarctica in order to test their equipment or to see what's happening because it's very dry and there's not a lot of water. And when the glaciers melt, then that water evaporates. Great. I, you know, th this audience is fairly sophisticated. There's a minimum SAT score to get in here. And as a consequence, they will know what, what is meant by this question. There are features on Mars. They're called recurring slope lineae. There are little streaks down the sides of you know, hills or crater walls or whatever that people have said in the past might be caused by the fact that when it's the Martian summer, some of that ice under the surface melts and it makes these sort of muddy tracks. That would be a great place to look for life. Are they really due to water? That's an interesting question. Um, I think originally we thought that it might be formed by brine flows, and I still kind of lean towards that. Um, some other uh, researchers think that it's, uh, they're formed by uh, dry flows going down the slopes. But the interesting thing, if you, if you look at some of these um, R cells, they call them, um, is that they follow the sun. They, they, they're active, like if you have R cell in a crater, where the sun hits it, you get the RSL. It goes all the way around the crater. So that, to me, suggests that, it, that there is some kind of a water component, whether it has a lot of salts in it or what. But there's, there's something more than just dry flows. No, that's it. OK, one last question. I guess this is for you, Pablo. Uh, you talked about a lot of rover hardware. And one thing that uh, some people may notice is that it's been 42 years since we sent a, uh, well, it was a lander, it wasn't a rover, to Mars to look for life. And the answer came back, probably not. So, you know, the public might wonder, well, why aren't we looking for life directly instead of doing all this mineralogy and that sort of thing? Okay, yeah, working, okay. So, um, that goes again in the technological barriers that we have encountered over the decades. And part of the problem that happened in the Vikings and they have like very amazing experiments to actually look for life, is that they weren't, can, hindsight is easy to see, but, uh, but back then, and over the next three decades after the Vikings in the 70s, uh, they didn't realize that while they were, uh, uh, I guess, working with the samples and they were breaking down to find the components and where there was some organics, they were also reacting with the salts. Uh, Mars is very rich in, in Chlorates, uh, chlorines, perchlorates, so things that are very nasty to life. So when you heat them up and you mix up everything organics, if there was any, with these uh, nasty salts, everything breaks down. So they didn't find anything. And it was like, like oh man, it's a failed experiment. You know, like we're looking for life, we didn't find any uh, where we thought there should be. So that kind of you know, put people a little bit in, into their, back in the lab and let's figure it out better and, and wait for a better chance to, to do it. And only recently uh, we've understood that, pro that problem, and now we're building new tools to be able to actually uh, look for life, not only directly with this kind of nasty treatments of warming up things and breaking down, but also indirectly by, the, by ways of looking for minerals and chemistries that only form when there is life. So, but we've only started to understand that, as Natalie could tell you, in the last uh, 10 years or so, when we're actually doing uh, field work in extreme places on the Earth, uh, Antarctica, Aracama, glaciers, volcanoes, where we're pushing the limits of life, but also technology to actually look for these things without breaking them up. So that's, to answer the question shortly, uh, we have to overcome a lot of technological barriers to be to a point where we can send something to Mars to actually look for life. You're willing to look for dead life, if that isn't an oxymoron. Right? <laughs> I mean, you think about it, there have been about 100 billion humans right, for the last 300,000 years. And, and you know, more than nine out of 10 of them are dead. So if you wanna look for humans on Earth, maybe you should look for the dead ones. Maybe not as interesting. All right, exactly. you are now invited to ask questions of this expert panel. Just you know, fight one another to get to this microphone down here. While people are thinking of their questions, I'll add on to what Pablo was just saying, that another thing, Viking was looking at the surface. And the surface is exposed to a lot of harsh conditions, and so a lot of the thinking is that if we might find biosignatures or evidence perhaps of life if we're looking below the surface. So that's another thing that's considered mm -hmm. for the future. Here's the ExoMars deep drill. So thanks, Dennis. Perfect. All right. Are we ready? Yeah. And if there's somebody in particular 
that you want to direct the question to do use their name. Otherwise, all three of them will answer all questions, and the estimated time that you'll be out of here is 4.30. <laughs> I just want to know why the rovers continue to be so slow. Um, <clears throat> the pictures you've seen from Mars, from orbit, everything looks flat and beautiful and nice. Uh, when you look down, it does not. There is boulders and other rocks, even pebbles the size of, you know, your, they said your fist. That can destroy a uh, wheel. As we've seen in the Carmen rover, sometimes we found like sharp uh, rocks that they basically open the wheel like they open a can. Mm. Like it's just, so the, the wheels are fragile, the rovers are heavy, and the equipment is expensive. So the engineers are taking all the precautions they can to actually drive. And if you, you live, I don't live here, but I come here often. And I, every time I come here, I see a lot of Teslas with Google cameras around. And what they're doing is explore the environment, explore every single thing you have around to make sure you can drive safely automatically. We don't have the luxury on Mars, so we're exploring as we go. So there is cameras that are doing real-time analysis of images, uh, something that we're taking actually heritage from, from Silicon Valley tech to actually make sure you're safe. And that means sometimes stopping the whole thing and wait for humans to make the decision. So it's a safety issue. Yeah. And besides the safety too, I think it's the science question. It's a long way. So if the rover finds something potentially interesting, then they send that data back and the scientists think about it and send a command back. So you have to wait for the radio signal to get all the way back to Earth and then the radio signal to get back to the rover. So yeah. that adds to the time as well. So, so look, at, look so at the difficulty no, of getting no autonomous rovers, vehicles right. to work here. <laughs> so, yeah. And you have to send all those commands to the spacecraft, and you get like two command cycles a day where you, just, you write all the commands you wanted to do, and then it's like, okay, I did this, now what? You know, and it takes a long time to um, tell it what to do because you've got to tell it everything you want to do, move right, whatever. Um, so it does take a long time to try to accomplish one target, you know, okay. uh, data Thank you. or something. Thanks very much for the question. Yes, sir. Hi, thank you very much for the session, very informative. Um, I have so many questions, I don't even know where to start, but I will limit myself to one. Uh, I've read since as a child that there is an ice cap um, in Mars, and uh, you could potentially melt it and uh, create water, liquid water again. Elon Musk recently actually also said, you know, you could use nuclear weapons to do that quickly. Um, <laughs> and um, I, I'm wondering, you guys are much the experts, what does it really take to terraform Mars? Um, can we do it with current technology? And if we were to do it, what is a realistic plan for that? I think if we, I'll, I'll answer about the, the ice caps. If we were to melt the frozen H2O and frozen CO2 there, it's not necessarily going to form a liquid on the surface because it's, it's cold and it's dry. So first we would need to create an atmosphere. So if we created the atmosphere first, then if you melted the the, these frozen um, water and CO2 ice caps, then it, you might get a liquid. But, I mean, that frozen CO2, that would be liquid at a very low temperature too, so that probably would never melt. But the, the water could be a liquid at, at certain times on Mars. The, it, the temperature goes above freezing in equatorial regions for short periods seasonally. Do, do we have the technology to create an atmosphere? <laughs> no. I don't think that's what I know of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. We fix our own planet, right? Exactly. Exactly. No, actually, part of the things that has been proposed is to, to nuke the surface and all the carbonates that Janice and, and Ginny are seeing from orbit, you break them up into CO2. And by doing that, you build an atmosphere which eventually will sustain liquid water on life, or liquid water on Mars, and maybe life. But, uh, but it will take a massive amount of uh, power, and it's not clear where there is enough carbonate to actually be able to have a thick enough atmosphere to create not just the pressure, but also the warming. So here is the opposite problem, as somebody mentioned. We need to create greenhouse effects on Mars to be able to, to make it human, I guess, friendly. Uh, so maybe if we just throw old refrigerators at Mars, <laughs> there you go. this good greenhouse <laughs> gas. Yes, sir. Yeah, so my question is more general. Uh, are these different agencies like NASA and ESA and, and others, are they collaborating with these projects or are they like competing with each other? 
I don't think they're competing. I think they, they have their own. And actually, there was supposed to be an ExoMars in 2018, and or maybe 2016. It, the, the dates get pushed off. They're these sort of two-year windows. And the US, uh, NASA, was supposed to be collaborating with ExoMars initially on some key components. And Congress decided not to spend that money. And so it threw the Europeans back a couple cycles. And so. But it would help if the agencies collaborate more and would be like a unified effort, yeah, like they, humanity. Yeah, I think they try. A lot of, most of the scientists, I mean, all of us work together with okay. international scientists. And sometimes there are NASA supported instruments on European missions or European supported instruments on NASA miss missions. Okay, good. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, an example is the, the laser that I was showing you, the remote telescope. That laser is built in France, and France is paying for it. So they're just giving it to NASA. And the same way NASA is building some sensors for the European mission. So there is, there is definitely high level collaboration. Uh, and it's not only for Mars, but across the, the whole space exploration yes, effort. Thank you, good, wonderful presentation. Um, my questions have to do with dust on the Martian surface. We know there are dust devils, we know there are planet-wide dust storms, and I'm assuming that moves dust from one location to another. So I have a two-part question. One is, do we have any idea what the dust is composed of? And second, how do the science experiments that do not drill um, allow for the, the effect of dust on the surface on top of what they're trying to get to in the you know, bedrock or whatever you want to call it underneath? I'll start first, and if you guys want to add in, I think that the dust has some, some positive effects and some not so good effects. So the, there were some experiments on Pathfinder to try to learn about the magnetic properties. And so they, they were able to use the, um, because the wind blows the dust around, they were able to see which kinds of particles collected on these magnets and then use other instruments on board to measure them because they were caught there. And, if there wasn't so much dust blowing around, they couldn't have done the experiment, so that was good. But another problem with the earlier rovers was they all had solar panels. So if dust collects on the solar panels, then you don't get a lot of energy and your rover dies. And a lot of these have moving parts, arms and whatever, and as the dust gets trapped in all of these little joints, then the parts mm -hmm. don't work as well. So, so that's another problem. Mm -hmm. But also the, the surface is thought to be rather sandblasted, so we talk about all chemical alteration early in the planet's history, and the recent alteration is more physical, so sandblasting from all this dust that's mm -hmm. floating around. And when we look at the dust, the chemistry of the dust, and the mineralogy, we don't really see like clays and iron oxides. Instead, we see some yeah. more mafic things. So it appears to be more like sand or tiny little bits of rock rather than altered things. So the highly altered things tend to be, if, I think if they're in rocks, then they're stable. But once they get mobile, they get ground up into um, tiny little fragments. Unfortunately, uh, the security people, I am told by Mr. Lee, the security people may be in here pretty soon. I don't know how many of you are trained in martial arts. You might want to take them on, but maybe not. So uh, Tatiana, maybe you'll be the last uh, question. And then you can grab these people individually. I, I apologize to the many people who stood uh, here for a while. Hi, um, so what it's been really clear to me about the dialogue around Mars is that so much of it is based on you learn more about Earth, you learn more about Mars, and you try to compare them as analogs. So what I wanted to ask Ginny was whether or not there's any key differences you see in these water-based features on Mars that might have to do with differences in pressure of the atmosphere in the past or just composition of the atmosphere, or history of geologic activity. That's a really good question. Um, we do see differences. Um, Largely, you know, just that maybe there's some features that are not there on, on Mars that we, that we see on Earth, and then we puzzle why aren't they there, and maybe that helps us explain what the environment was like at that time. But in general, overall, there's a, uh, we do see a lot more similarity than dissimilarities, I would say. That answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right, I apologize again to those of you who didn't get to ask a question. Depending on when security shows up, you might be able to assault these people individually. I would just like to first thank them, but secondly, uh, normally we give our uh, present uh, the presenters here fifteen thousand dollars in Bitcoin, <laughs> but but our CEO Bill has gone for door number two, so you're each going to get a mug. Woohoo! <laughs> 
please thank our speakers. Thank you, Seth.